a okay, lot of great cool. vistas. However, what I heard, you may want to check this out, what I heard is that they were doing some construction. We'll get started in a couple of minutes uh, while folks find your seats. We have a couple of seats up front if anyone wants to join us up front. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Andre Beausoleil. And welcome to the orchestration of Fiber Channel Cloud Technologies for Private Cloud Deployments. Uh, thank you for joining this session this morning. This is uh, one of our first sessions. And I realize it's also tax day, so um, I'm glad you're prioritizing what's important here as, as it comes to Fiber Channel and the OpenStack community. <clears throat> So uh, we have a, an, a, an agenda that uh, I want to share with you today where we're going to talk about uh, the fiber channel uh, support that we're adding to OpenStack. 
Uh, we're also going to talk about what we're delivering in Grizzly and what we have planned for Havana and beyond. Uh, we're also going to uh, have a call to action if you want to get involved in the effort that uh, we've started on. Uh, uh, we're hoping that you can, uh, you can partake. Uh, and what I want to talk about is how we're adding uh, fiber channel support to, uh, to OpenStack. Can everyone hear me fine in the back? Everyone? Good? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so how did we get here? Um, this journey actually started six months ago at the last OpenStack Summit, which was the, uh, the Grizzly Design Summit in San Diego. And I, uh, I attended the show with the, uh, with the specific intention of hopefully meeting uh, similar folks who had interest in pursuing fiber channel and getting fiber channel added to, to OpenStack. And, uh, and sure enough, at one of, uh, one of John Griffiths, who's the team lead for, uh, for, the, uh, for the volume manager uh, initiative, Cinder, he said, well, you know, there are a couple of guys from HP who are gonna talk about fiber channel. You may wanna sync up with them. And sure enough, I synced up with the HP guys. And then we went to the design summit we talked about uh, you know, extending fiber channel and, uh, and sure enough, we met up with some EMC folks and, and some IBM folks and, uh, and lo and behold, we had a quorum. So uh, after the summit, uh, we held uh, regular meetings to talk about um, how do we go about this process of adding fiber channel to OpenStack and, uh, and lo and behold, here we are uh, uh, hosting one of the very first fiber channel sessions. So I think we've made a, a lot of progress and I, I wanna thank uh, everyone from the multi-vendor community who was involved here. I think they deserved a, a round of applause for making this session possible. And when we talk about fiber channel, um, this is not you know, new technology. Fiber channel has been around for well over 15 years. Uh, a lot of data centers have defined footprints. And what I want to stress here is that uh, although it's, it's a mature technology, it's, it's not dying, it's not going away. Uh, clearly IDC says there's growth rates that's projected uh, out uh, through 2016 where we can see uh, fiber channel storage growing at about a 36% uh, rate, uh, compounded annual growth rate. So uh, clearly, uh, as we provide support for fiber channel, we're empowering folks to take advantage of what they have today, and then hopefully, uh, as they grow their environments, they can continue to add fiber channel support in their OpenStack uh, deployments. So, um, and a lot of questions that we get from, from the community is, uh, so, so why fiber channel in OpenStack? Um, you know, this is uh, you know, something uh, fairly new. Uh, I say, why not? Uh, the whole process of delivering OpenStack is to allow uh, some level of interoperability and extensibility to incorporate different uh, types of storage and management of different types of storage within the environment. So we saw it as an opportunity to, uh, to, to again, uh, stay, stay to the OpenStack uh, and the open source community and, and allowing the incorporation of, uh, of fiber channel and also we realized that a lot of uh, companies, a lot of organizations, as they deploy um, you know, their, their private cloud environment, fiber channel is probably a good fit. You know, and they have, they have the expertise, uh, they know what fiber channel delivers in terms of performance, resiliency. Um, this is, these are things that they wanna take advantage of, particularly when it comes to the applications that require uh, a fiber channel infrastructure, right? So we all know, you know, when you look at the database, large database applications, when you look at the exchange servers, uh, those are all applications that require this type of infrastructure. So we saw it as, as necessary, and, uh, and this, is, this is just the right time. We expect this to grow uh, in the future. Now what I'd like to do is uh, bring up to the stage uh, Edgar St. Pierre and have Edgar go through a couple of slides and, and, and I'll be back shortly. You want to just stay up there? Good morning, everyone. Um, so what are we talking about here? We're talking about choices, right? So my dad was a carpenter, and he always said that you use the right tool for the right job. Now, I use that as a great excuse to go out and buy new toys for every project I do around the house. But 
in the data center, what we're talking about is providing the right technologies for the kind of solutions that you're trying to provide in the environment. So if you're talking about low latency transactional workloads, you probably have existing implementations already in your environment that are leveraging fiber channel. And you should be able to use that in your OpenStack environment as well. So whether you're talking about migrating solutions from legacy implementations that are running on hardware and it's a consolidation play where you want to bring them into a virtualized environment and you want to bring these into OpenStack, great, you'll be able to do that. Or even if you're migrating from the VMware environment into OpenStack, you'll be able to do that for cost reduction purposes. So you've got options now, if you're looking for fiber channel plays, that you can actually implement in your OpenStack environment. Both iSCSI and fiber channel, it's a matter of options and choices. And the benefits you gain from this is you can leverage your existing resources, not just the physical resources, but your people resources, your processes associated with how do I actually manage my fiber channel infrastructure, my highly resilient infrastructure, perhaps including remote replication capabilities you might have uh, in play as well. So you'd actually be able to introduce that into your solutions as well. So what have we done so far? Um, there's been two blueprints, one completed and one proposed. So in the Grizzly uh, timeframe, we completed the initial blueprint, um, which was to introduce fiber channel for initial connectivity from KVM into Cinder uh, block storage. Uh, coming up in the Havana timeframe, uh, we'll be talking about how do we actually um, create uh, connectivity or zoning fabric within uh, the fiber channel environment for you to create uh, connectivity on the fly instead of having a pre-zoned uh, configuration or an open zoning configuration. Now, this is important from the perspective of this session is really the first formal session that we've had any discussion of fiber channel within the OpenStack community at all. So the fact that we have, and we'll be talking about the design session summits that we have coming up later on this week, just the fact that we have a, a first fiber channel uh, session here is, is significant. So with that, I want to hand it over to uh, Gary Thunquest, who's going to talk about uh, more about Grizzly. Great, thanks, Edgar. So one of the goals that we had when uh, when all of these these you know different vendors came together at the Grizzly Summit, um, you know, around fiber channel was. You know, how do we come up with one implementation of Fiber Channel that all of us can now use and integrate uh, you know, different products into and, uh, and bring Fiber Channel into this environment? So we used this, you know, this group that, that came together at the last summit, and uh, we used that to, uh, as we created the first blueprint, to bring that blueprint in and do a lot of reviewing, refining, extending, so that it met all of our needs. Um, and then even as we went into implementation, being able to use this group to be able to review the progress and, uh, and just, just refine and make sure that everything was going to work for all of us as we did this. And as we look at this, this is really just a, a six-month period of time that we've been able to go from, you know, people shaking hands and saying, hi, I am, you know, I'm Gary or, you know, whatever, and, uh, you know, to where we have blueprints submitted and then code was submitted code was accepted and, uh, and this is shipping now in Grizzly. So um, I think this is, you know, is a good accomplishment. But let me walk through and, and talk about, so what is it that we have added to Grizzly and what's there and how can you take advantage of it? So in, in Grizzly as it exists, uh, as, as, as uh, it did exist, iSCSI storage is, uh, is the only type of storage that Cinder understands. There are drivers that, uh, that connect to different devices that bring fiber channel storage into the environment, excuse me, iSCSI storage in the environment, and attaches that to VM hosts uh, all over iSCSI. What we did uh, first off in this first phase of fiber channel work was to bring in a new interface into the Cinder um, to allow us to create fiber channel um, drivers in the environment. So what exists today is a, uh, um, you know, a, a base class of, um, around iSCSI. We extended and added a new base class around Fiber Channel that allows any vendor now to come in and subclass off of that to create their Fiber Channel driver to their device. Okay, so that's the first part. Is, uh, is being able to enable the development of, of drivers, of fiber channel device drivers in the environment. The second piece then is fiber channel obviously has some very uh, different uh, characteristics than iSCSI. 
So we needed to bring in some mechanisms to be able to accommodate that, uh, specifically around addressing and how, how SCSI is managed at the fiber channel level via uh, or versus an iSCSI level. Um, today, the, uh, the iSCSI you know, mechanisms that exist between Nova uh, on the client side and Cinder on the storage side are around you know, getting IQNs uh, and addresses off of the host, exchanging those then with um, IQNs addresses of the, on the storage side, uh, with IP addresses addressing uh, the storage target. With Fiber Channel, um, there's a, it's, it's a little bit different in that it's, it is a lower level protocol that has typically um, multiple ports on your hosts. Multipathing is done above Fiber Channel as opposed to with iSCSI where it's below. And so it required us to bring in some, uh, some extensions in the, in the um, exchanging of addresses, uh, initiator and target addresses between the two uh, client and storage systems, Nova and, and, and Cinder management pieces to do this. So there was some Cinder work that had to be done uh, to be able to accommodate this. And then lastly, there's a piece over on Innova that needed to be changed. From the hypervisor standpoint, to be able to import volumes um, via fiber channel to then uh, connect them up to VMs required some changes over in the hypervisor side. So as part of this, we made the changes to KVM uh, to be able to, uh, to accept and uh, um, attach fiber channel storage into uh, to those hosts and, uh, and have it be able to attach those to, uh, to the VMs. And so uh, that, that was a piece of work done as well. Then lastly, we did some work of bringing in a fiber channel uh, driver, a storage device driver. Um, being at HP, we did uh, the HP 3PAR device. Um, so we, we submitted the, uh, a driver, a fiber channel driver for the 3PAR array. And that really can serve as a, as a reference implementation for a fiber channel device driver. Um, that was something that as our group was working together, there were a number of vendors that were doing fiber channel device drivers, and so we were able to share code quickly and, and, uh, and, and easily and get that um, you know, incorporated across some of the other vendor drivers as well. So, um, so there, are, there are now more than just the HP driver even in, in the Grizzly release. So, so those were the major components uh, of what was done here uh, for the Grizzly release. So what you end up with is, is an environment where you can have um, in your data center, you can uh, use those fiber channel uh, arrays um, and, uh, and, and fiber channel SANs connecting those to the hosts. Uh, the way that we work through this, um, being able to handle both single fabrics as well as multiple fabrics. So if you have redundant uh, and resilient uh, you know, deployments and, and infrastructure build outs, that can be accommodated. And, uh, and volumes that are created over on, on the array can be created through Cinder, attached over to the hosts, and then attached up to the VMs uh, via Nova. So all that was part of uh, what's in Grizzly here. Okay, so, so what can we do now? So if you are uh, a storage vendor um, and you have some uh, you know, fiber channel devices that would be useful to people building clouds, you can take this and you can build a, uh, a driver for your, your device and integrate that into the system. Okay, you can use the HP 3PAR driver as a reference or uh, the other drivers that exist are, are coming in now as well. Uh, for, uh, for reference implementations. If you are building out a cloud environment, so if you are a, uh, you know, a data center where you are bringing in and building out that private cloud or a service provider that does want to use Fiber Channel, um, it is in Grizzly, it's working, and uh, it's, it's there and, and can be taken advantage of. Um, from a user perspective, uh, the nice thing is, is that as you would expect, uh, this is you know, completely transparent to users, whether they are using iSCSI storage or, or fiber channel storage. Uh, you know, they use the, the Cinder operations to just do the create, delete, attach, detach, snap, you know, all those things. And uh, it happens whether the infrastructure is using iSCSI or, or fiber channel, it's really transparent to them. So, so that's goodness there. So known limitations. So there are some, uh, uh, you know, some things to keep in mind if you are building out an environment using this fiber channel work that we've done. 
Uh, the first thing, you know, everyone always asks is, okay, well, what about zoning? You know, what are you doing for fabric zoning? Zoning is an area where we really felt that fabric orchestration was something that we wanted to, to separate from the storage device orchestration. So in this first phase, um, we have not implemented anything for automated zoning in the fabric. Okay, so that does bring in some, some limitations. It requires then that, that in what's in Grizzly in this first phase, that the SAN either be open zoned or be pre-zoned. Okay, so since there's no automated zoning, you know, that's, you know, one of those approaches is what, uh, is what you need to do. Or if you want, I, I suppose you could take one of the drivers or build your own driver and, and build in zoning as part of it. That's certainly an option. But what, what is coming is um, a, a second phase of fiber tunnel work that Edgar referenced, uh, a second blueprint for Havana that is going to address zoning. So we're going to talk about that here in a couple of minutes, and Andrea will go through that. But that's something to, to know about as a limitation for the current Grizzly impl uh, implementation. The second thing is around security. So iSCSI has this mechanism of using CHAP to be able to, um, to authenticate clients and servers, initiators and targets across SCSI. Um, so a secret uh, is, is effectively you know, injected into both the initiator and target side. That's used then to authenticate that, that client at connect time to assure that, that you, know, you, can, you can put access control reliably around volume uh, attachment to, uh, to servers, to hosts, and, uh, and have, uh, have that be done securely. Fiber Channel doesn't have a mechanism that's, uh, that's directly analogous to that. Um, Fiber Channel does have um, you know, access, access controls at the fabric level. Um, it also has access controls typically at the, at the server target level uh, in, uh, in some of the masking capabilities that storage devices generally have. However, those mechanisms are reliant on the initiator's address uh, being, um, uh, being trustworthy, being trustable. With NPIV, uh, where you can change addresses uh, on client side, um, that may not be the case. So one thing that we wanted to stress is, is that when you're using this, this fiber channel solution as it exists in Grizzly, um, it's, you need to make sure that, that end users, uh, untrusted individuals don't have access to NPIV uh, mechanisms on the host to be able to change addressing because it could in your, it, the way it, it could in your, in your build out of the, of the infrastructure they could get access to, to things that they shouldn't, depending on how you condition the fabric and, and build things out. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, now, in most deployments, end users don't have access to that mechanism, and it's not an issue. If you are doing any kind of a, uh, of a bare metal or a, um, uh, a, a, a capability where they did have access to that mechanism, it's something you need to keep in mind and actually work through that and make sure that your environment is still secure. Okay. Um, then lastly, hypervisor support. So um, we mentioned that we did, uh, we did the changes for KVM around being able to accept fiber channel storage and, and attach those to VMs. We did that only for KVM. Um, there's some work in Havana that started uh, that we're working with some teams to get this integrated in with VMware. Um, and so it will be there. Um, but those are the, uh, there's also some talk of, uh, of some Hyper-V work going on. So today, KVM only, and uh, there's some other hypervisors are coming, so, uh, so not yet on some of the others. So, so those are some of the limitations that we have in terms of what we have in Grizzly. So now Andre is going to talk about now where are we going to go from here uh, th with Havana. OK, thank you. As everyone, uh, can you hear me? OK, so as everyone see, this is a very, uh, it's a multi-vendor approach. Uh, we're doing this uh, transition uh, to cover different aspects of the, of the slides. Um, I just wanted just by a show of hands, uh, who has a, uh, a fiber channel uh, private cloud deployment uh, and they're looking at adding, a f or, or you may not have a fiber channel cloud deployment, you may have a, a private cloud deployment and you're looking at adding fiber channel. By a show of hands, uh, anyone working on a, on a project here? 
So this is just, we're, we're, so we're planting the seeds. So hopefully by, my goal is by the next OpenStack Summit, we'll have at least a third of your hands up in the air, very high, and, and very interested in, in doing some of these deployments. Okay, so if, uh, if anything, I want to uh, stress this particular slide because this is really what we're delivering or what we're planning on uh, proposing and delivering in Havana, right? So what it shows is that we want to extend Cinder's volume manager to uh, automate the fiber channel zone management aspect when there is fiber channel storage that's deployed and fabric zoning is enabled, right? This is gonna be a, a functionality that's transparent to the end user, so it's all being, uh, it's all being managed in the back so that, uh, that you can get access to that fiber channel storage, right? So uh, Gary talked about, you know, when they came out with the fiber channel block storage, uh, you know, we assumed a couple of things around zoning, right? And uh, one of those things is that, you know, it's either uh, an open zone environment or the environment has been pre-zoned to accommodate. So what we're doing here in providing the uh, fiber channel uh, zone management capability is to automate the, uh, the addition of uh, zone resources, right, to update the, the zone sets when you add uh, compute resources to your cloud environment. Right? And similarly, when you remove those resources, we want to be able to update those, those zone sets uh, as well and do it uh, you know, in, in the background. So uh, there are a couple of things that we're also wanting to add to the, uh, to the fiber channel zone manager is an API that allows for integration similar to the fiber channel block API to, uh, to other vendor uh, solutions so that we can take a, uh, they can take advantage of uh, some of the southbound uh, information, right? So we'll be able to do zone management uh, across the entire enterprise. And then we realize that uh, as you create uh, uh, resource, uh, compute resources, that we'll need to provide context for uh, in the Nova side. So that's probably gonna be uh, a separate addition to the blueprint that we'll do to support uh, uh, that Nova component as well. So uh, let's talk about some additional requirements, right? So, uh, you know, in, in coming out with the Fiber Channel Zone Manager, there are a couple of things we'll have to address that, you know, to make this somewhat automated and transparent to the user. One will have to uh, come up with a zoning mode, and the zoning mode essentially would uh, identify whether you have a fiber channel uh, uh, fabric uh, zoning enabled or not. Uh, it may, uh, whether you have uh, target-driven zoning. Uh, so we'll, with, this, uh, with this particular uh, configuration, we can then uh, invoke the fiber channel zone manager functionality. And then uh, we talk about uh, zone grouping policies. And zone grouping policies really shows the relationship between the, uh, the, the, the whole system and, and the storage system, right? The initiator and the target for, on fiber channel. And there are a couple of different scenarios here, right? So we may have uh, a zone uh, scenario where you have just uh, one uh, target assigned to uh, one, one initiator, right? Uh, or we may have one initiator uh, that has, uh, can, has visibility to multiple targets, right? So we have to be able to, to manage those, those zone set configurations accordingly. And then um, we want to be able to, of course, as we create and manage these zone sets, uh, be able to enumerate the, uh, the, the sand contacts uh, as well as the, the, the fabric contacts. So, um, you know, we have that information readily available. Lastly, uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, what we're uh, delivering in terms of the Havana release, which is going to be focused on more uh, simplified zone management. And what I mean by that is that we're going to have one active uh, zone set, and as you add uh, compute resources to that zone set, uh, we'll, we'll update the members on that zone set. If you remove compute resources and you have a zone set that has multiple members, uh, we'll not just kill the zone, but we'll just remove that, com that component or that member uh, from the zone set. If it so happens that it's a single initiator and, and a single target uh, uh, creation, when you remove the, uh, the, the compute resources, we'll just kill the zone set. So we'll have the ability to add update, 
and remove as well. So that, that's an important delivery uh, for, the, uh, for the Havana release. Now, uh, post Havana, we're going to be looking at uh, widening this to support more uh, enhanced zone management, uh, be able to support uh, you know, full life cycle set management and, and multiple uh, active zone sets, right? To, uh, to be um, uh, probably something that a you know, large enterprise can, can deploy within the environment as they're doing today. So that's, that's the step approach that we're taking in, uh, in supporting both simplified and enhanced uh, zone set configuration. And what I want to do now is uh, just talk about uh, what we're doing in terms of the vendor community. And I'm going to bring uh, Edgar back on stage to talk about what EMC is, uh, is planning. Thanks, Andre. OK, so in Grizzly, uh, EMC completed its iSCSI integration for uh, VNX and for VMAX. And what we've done is we've simply built on top of that to include fiber channel capability that didn't quite make it into the Grizzly release, but will be there in the uh, Havana timeframe, both for VMAX and VNX. And we'll have a whole host of other volume drivers as well that support the rest of the EMC um, product family for iSCSI connectivity at least. And then also in the Havana timeframe, we'll be looking at how we handle quality of service within a single volume driver across multiple pools within a single storage array, including multiple protocols, so for fiber channel and iSCSI connectivity. Uh, and finally, of course, we'll be testing with the uh, fiber channel zone manager work that is going on in Havana. It's a very important integration for us, and we'll make sure that uh, that takes place as well. So um, a heads up for design sessions for the developers who are here. Um, I just heard you know, Thierry say, please don't go to the design s sessions because they're intentionally small rooms. Um, so if you're a developer and you're interested in fiber channel uh, activity within, uh, uh, within Cinder. So on Thursday, all the Cinder sessions are on Thursday. There's also one Nova session associated with this. The first one is the uh, fiber channel uh, sand zone access control manager that Andre was just talking about. That's late in the afternoon on Thursday, the 18th. Um, the purpose is to introduce the particular topic that we have here in terms of being able to create zones and zone sets within uh, a, uh, a sender environment. Um, there's also multi-attach and read-only volumes, which happens earlier in the morning on Thursday. Now that is to be able to provide for cluster configurations, right? Uh, <clears throat> there are other use cases as well, but specifically for cluster uh, configurations, very important within uh, a VMware environment, running within OpenStack, for example. And finally, associated with this, there's also the VMware Compute Driver Roadmap session, which unfortunately runs concurrent with the, uh, uh, the cluster discussion as well on Thursday, um, but that will also be touching on uh, fiber channel connectivity as well. Now, Gary, I think you were going to uh, roll this up for us. All right, yeah, so I think just to end, uh, you know, just summarize, what, what do we got? So in Grizzly, what we have is, you know, the infrastructure in place to be able to come in and you can actually deploy your private cloud using fiber channel storage uh, connected to your hosts and, uh, and to put that into a production environment. So if that's of interest to you, you know, that's something that you ought to be able to do with Grizzly and what's been, uh, just been released. If you are a vendor um, and, and this is of interest to you, there's also the interfaces now in place for you to be able to create drivers for your product, to be able to bring those into the ecosystem and support them in the OpenStack environment. So, uh, so hopefully, you know, if that's uh, of interest to you, that's a place where you can jump in and, uh, and be a part of this as well. There's also, as we, uh, you know, Andre talked about, new things coming in Havana to start orchestrating the fabric as well. Uh, that's coming here in Havana. And, and really, I guess for all of this, you know, if you are interested in being a part of this, if you're a developer uh, or, uh, or someone who wants to be you know, even closer to you know, what's going on in this area, feel free to contact um, you know, myself, Gary, uh, Thunquest HP, uh, Andre, um, um, Edgar as well. Um, our emails are up there. So you know, plug in and contribute, and uh, we would love to have you a part of it. So I think that's all we've got, so thank you. If you have any questions, comments? Yeah. Yeah, 
So it's it just like with iSCSI, this is all management path, right. configuration path, uh, orchestration. Once things are put are configured and put in place, those infrastructure services are all using data paths, and there's no you know nothing is no open stack in the in the data path there. Right. So, so right. So this is all configuration orchestration, um, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, so I think that the, that the solution that we are headed towards would enable those kind of policies to get implemented. So now I don't know that that will be part of Havana, um, but the interfaces that are coming into play uh, would allow us to start you know, getting more finer grained, uh, putting more finer grained access control mechanisms in there if you have infrastructure that you, know, that you want to orchestrate to, to be able to, to configure it to that level of granularity. Right. So the original question was, what about LUN-based zoning? So yeah, sorry. The answer is yes. So I don't know if you want to comment as well, Andre. Yeah. No, no. I think you, you so, covered the, okay. uh, the essential. Any others? Is, is there roadmaps on on the uh, tuning and, and bringing in reporting information and, and bringing that back to the open source player as well? So in a multi-vendor situation, you can kind of see from a single pane of glass all the all the information. Well, yeah, I, the, the the purpose and the goal is is not to really um, um, you know, put a monitoring system in for for everything in the environment. Um, you know, I think that the, the the focus right now of 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 monitoring um, is really at that infrastructure service level. Um, the resources, your physical resource consumption and utilization, um, and troubleshooting and break fix and you know all that stuff. Is, is kind of your, your physical infrastructure management problem still, um, but not your open stack solution. Yeah. There, there will be, I mean, if you look at one of the other projects going on within open stack right now, Solometer, right? So that's raising it up one level, and it's looking at it um, at a level that does relate to open stack. Now, how do you tie the relationship between events that might be detected within Solometer within the infrastructure back and forth. I think that's still got a long way to go before that's actually there. And roadmaps are worked out every six months, <laughs> right? So um, I, I think that's more of a stay tuned kind of uh, question. Yeah, so. With, with SIOC, if you think about that, that goes through VMware, where VMware is in the data path, and it's able to monitor uh, different characteristics about the I.O. In this case here, uh, you'd have to add the same capabilities into something like the KVM hypervisor or Zen or whatever the case may be. So SIOC is strictly a, a data path function, whereas what we're doing within Cinder is strictly a control path function. Right? So, if you want to evolve some of the other hypervisors to monitor for uh, you know, latency and things like that, that, that it can react to, then that's going to be built into the hypervisors. Do you guys picture the enterprise use cases being more a case of dedicated SAN to the OpenStack implementation or a mixed use SAN fabric where OpenStack is just a consumer of the, and there was more traditional use cases? Yeah, I think, I think our, our envision vision really is is both you know whether and typically things you know what we've seen is they start with that small POC where it's just a slice of infrastructure um, that could certainly grow from there and be all but yeah there's not an assumption that that the entirety of the infrastructure is owned um, you know by by the solution yeah uh, options it's all about options yeah yeah right Kelly. yeah and and again as as uh as uh, environments that have established uh, fiber channel infrastructure, as they look to, you know, leverage uh, some of those resources, uh, we figure they'll they'll take a piece of it and dedicate it to their cloud uh, deployments and 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 start getting some some play there. But uh, we want to make this yes, we want to make this transparent. 
we want to uh, open the doors to allow them to incorporate that management of their fiber channel infrastructure, whether it be dedicated or whether it be a, a, a hybrid you know, solution. So I'm not sure I caught all of your question. So, yeah, I, I only caught some, some part of it. Yeah. So the question about snapshots, for example. Snapshots are supported. Right. So the major change here was. I'm talking about snapshots at the LUN basis, not at the very much in basis, because I'm Chinese, very consuming in resources. Right. So, that, so Cinder does support snapshots at the LUN basis, yeah. at the LUN level, <coughs> um, snaps and clones of volumes. And then, but where Fiber Channel comes in, the changes here are really around now attaching those over a, a different type of a, of a storage network than what we had before, iSCSI, and now there's an option of you can use Fiber Channel as well. But the storage functions uh, are retained, you know, still create, delete, snap, clone, um, you know, those kind of things are still in place. Yeah, good. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. You know, what what do we see as the end game here? Is this is this just a, a bridge a bridge approach? Mm -hmm. um, and do we really see this going away? And I think no. You know, I think our our position and and really as Andre talked about, you know, what is, where is Fiber Channel going and what is is the adoption rate? You know, looking like it's something that's going to tail off and and really we're, what um, you know analysts are saying is a no. You know, this is a tool that has a place, and there, is a, there, there are times when that's the preferred tool to use. And we don't see that going away. And in fact, what we see is the need to bring that into the cloud paradigm so that people can deploy those kinds of applications in the cloud that do want that as, uh, you know, that type of predictability and resilience and, and uh, um, you know, those behaviors at the fabric level. So, so it's not something we see as a, as a bridge or stopgap. In fact, on the contrary, you know, we see it being uh, you know, something that's very sustainable and, uh, and going forward. Yeah, I completely echo that. If you think about design to fail uh, application implementation, I mean, there, there's not a tremendous amount of experience. There's definitely a growing amount of experience in the industry for cloud scale application development. But the fact of the matter, there's a ton of applications out there that are more <laughs> transaction oriented that need low latency um, um, implementations within the infrastructure, and those are not going away anytime soon. So, is this stopgap? No, I think this is more of let's bring all these other applications into play that haven't yeah. been discussed up to now because it's been all about cloud scale, it's been all about test dev type applications. Let's bring these other applications into the conversation as well. For, for so cluster. that was one. That's one of the design sessions this week. So yeah, there is discussion around that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. It, 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 yeah. It, it is an important you know, paradigm that we need to bring into the mix, so those applications can uh, can be a part of a, this environment. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you very much. You appreciate oh, it. Thank you. Thank you. Not impossible.